recipes in there. It was a wonderful read. I'm so excited to have you. Uh, before we get into it, we do have uh, the first Thacker Mountain Radio back in the store this Thursday. It's been over two years now. Uh, we we're really excited about that and we forgot the book's name, so give me a second and I can be a better worker. Uh, do to do. Yes, it's Adam Soto for Concerning Those Who Have Fallen Asleep. It's really exciting, so if you're around, come. We fill up the whole store. It's a blast, okay? Um, I think that's all the housekeeping. If there's more, I won't do it. <laughs> uh, so again, thank you, Dee. We're so happy you're here. And we're going to take questions a little bit later, too. Um, but first things first, tell us about yourself. Okay. Now, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. The store is absolutely gorgeous, and it's been so much fun shopping in it uh, that that's been worth the trip down from Nashville in the first place, so <laughs> I've been enjoying it. Um, so I am approaching 50. Uh, I grew up in Louisville, Kentucky, and um, I grew up in an Italian-American family, and when I say that, I mean the family that was about 50% Italian-American and 50% on my father's side, which was a mix of different cultures, but the Italian-American side took over everything. And we lived like an Italian-American family, which I never thought was particularly different from how my peers were being raised at the time. However, as I got older and I would talk to people, you know, and, and particularly uh, my partner, would say things like, you know, people aren't normally raised that way. <laughs> That's not what people normally do. And so, um, you know, I learned the value of my upbringing over time. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's wonderful. Now, um, I Googled you because that's what we do. Now, oh, I guess I'm not talking to my, yeah, there we go. Um, I Googled you because that's what we do. Now, I know you're also an expert in tarot, but I've been seeing on your Instagram that you are not using the writer weight when you do a pull. You're using the Leo, oh, correct, say it correctly. The Emblemata Le Normand is what I uh, do a daily card pull with. Yes. Now, I have been reading tarot since I was about 11 years old. That's when I got oh, yeah. the first deck. I told my mom and grandma I wanted a tarot deck, and um, St. Christopher came and brought me a tarot deck in my shoe that year, which shows you the strange blending of uh, Catholicism and folk Catholicism in my family because, you know, St. Christopher doesn't normally, or not St. Christopher, St. Nicholas. St. Nicholas doesn't normally come and leave divination tools in children's shoes, but uh, that year St. Nicholas did for me. Um, but uh, when I was 16, I picked up. Um, my first Le Normand deck, mm -hmm. which is different. It's a 36 card deck instead of a 78 card deck, and the symbolism is quite different. How you read the cards is quite different. And about three, no, six years ago, I started working on my own deck. So mm -hmm. that is my own deck you're seeing. Down the no. Road. Yes. Shut up. That is so cool. <laughs> okay. Uh, Black Candle Cottage on Instagram. Pull your phones out. I want you to go look at that deck because it's beautiful. I was wondering. I was going to ask you about that. So that's good to know. Um, so I know you were raised, uh, and in the book you say it's just the things we do. Now, um, you really talk about the value of ancestors and of your living elders and your family and your found family. Now, is just this kind of what prompted you to write the book? You were like, this is knowledge I have to share? Or like, what, what brought you to that? Um, for about the past 20 years, I have been doing workshops and classes on occult and esoteric topics, and none of them included any information about my family's traditional practices because I was just so focused on some of the other methodologies that I learned as I got older. I got very into ceremonial magic and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and when my daughter was born, Mm -hmm. that's when things started to change a little bit because I got to see my daughter spend some time with my grandmother, her great-grandmother. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that time was going to be short because my grandma was already in her 90s. And I thought, my daughter is not going to get time with 
my grandmother for long. Mm. How do I capture these things? And how do I share with my daughter some of these traditions as she gets older? And it started from there. And then the impetus was behind me. I, I tell people, when you work with your ancestors, you know you're on the right track when suddenly you're fast-tracked with something and you can feel the, the support and push from your ancestors and it just, everything started moving very quickly after that. And the next thing I knew, I was um, you know, revising my first draft of Burn a Black Candle, or what would become Burn a Black Candle. That is, that is so beautiful. That is, oh wow. Yeah, the transfer of knowledge from generation to generation is extremely valuable and uh, I'm so impressed with this. I, I hope that you are too. I am, I feel so blessed with all of it. The, yeah. the writing process was a learning process for me and a realization of the value of what my family had given me. Um, and then everything that has come after it has been this wonderful celebration of my family's practices, but also learning and meeting other people, learning what they do, what their families do. Um, you know, that has been the hugest blessing when it's come to what this book has brought into my life. Oh, God, I love it. Well, so that actually leads to something we were talking about earlier when we were over at the metaphysical section was the, like, kind of the, the, the passive, I'm not saying this right, transference isn't the right word either, so give me a second, right? Um, the common lines that we have uh, when practicing folk witchcraft or um, just tradition, so like we mentioned, you know, the kitchen table is where everything happens. And so that is true for, obviously, an Italian-American family. And for someone who grew up in the Deep South, the kitchen table is where you learn important news, it's what you, uh, it's where you learn how to cook, obviously. Uh, the kitchen is where all of the news is happening. It's just the center, mm -hmm. right? And you also have in the book uh, something about taking your shoes off at the door, which I'm a little militant about, <laughs> and it felt very good to uh, see someone else with another justification as to why I'm right. Um, and I'm always right, thank you. Uh, for that, and um, the next, I lost my thread. Oh well, right? Um, but, oh, shoot. Yeah, you think, you're, I got this one too. Yeah, so this is, this is the fancy one. new one. This is the arc that I dog-eared and beat up. They're both beautiful, but hardcover, right? right? So in, um, in this book, I'm gonna go to a couple of things that I really, oh, there's the shoe thing. Uh, <laughs> it's all here, and I was like, this is important. I'm glad I made people happy. <laughs> I felt good. good. Thank you. My mother was also militant, and, and she was unrepentant. When I had a friend come who had never come to the house, it did not matter. She stopped in at the door, and she was like, take your shoes off. Like, there was not a lot of pleas or thank you know. She's busy hugging them and everything, but it was also, take your shoes off. So. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you, Mama. Uh, so also, like, moving from the kitchen table, you've got a lot of recipes in here, which, you know, in a lot of grimoires, you'll get like um, potions or elixirs and things like that, and you're like, here's some garlic bread, suckers. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about these recipes? Just tell us a little bit of fun about this. I had them. an internal conflict about the recipes. Really, I did, and including them, and if I should include them or not, because a lot of time, Italian-American folk magical practices immediately gets categorized as kitchen witchery, which, and I'm not bashing that, because a lot of it is centered on the kitchen, and it is centered on, you know, the home and, and food and all of these wonderful things. But I wanted to, it did not feel like that was the entirety of my magic, my family's magical practices, and so I wanted to make sure that it had this expanded sphere that, that I was talking about, but I just couldn't resist putting the food in Thank after you. a while. <laughs> Thank you. You were right to do it. It is, yeah, growing up Italian American, and I'm sure growing up in many other cultures, it is not just nurturing to the body, it is nurturing to the soul when we eat the food of our culture, when food is prepared out of love and concern for your well-being. I mean, that is some of the true magic that happens in everybody's household, whether they realize they're doing magical work or not. 
And the recipes that I did include were the ones that are so significant to me that I could not find a way to proceed without including them in the book. I am grateful. <laughs> Y'all will be grateful. Trust me. Um, so I promise we'll move from the kitchen. But this is a thought I had um, while driving up here to work today. Was While I was reading your book, you mentioned your altars and how everybody um, creates their own altars in their own ways. And I love the bed. I'd love you to speak on that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, but you mentioned in the book your mother sort of having an open space on the counter, like, that won't do. And putting uh, either candles or a photograph of a, of a loved one. And it made me think um, of this podcast I've listened to recently, and they said that altars were traditional place in the kitchen for a lot of places. And that brought, sorry, this is exhausting, this is my brain. And that brought me to looking at my fridge at home and all of the photographs <laughs> of the people I love. And I instantly was like, darn, I'm not handle, you know? <laughs> um, and I, I, I want you to talk about the, the small altars that we make that we may not know we make, because you talked about that in the book. So I'd love to hear it from you. Yeah, small altars are a big thing for me. So it is true, my mother's family altar, she would never call it an altar, it's just her special place in the house. Uh, her altar is on her kitchen counter. My altar is very close to my kitchen counter in the dining room. Why? Because that's where my mother's is, and, and I want to keep that tradition going. But the thing is, is that uh, we joke around a lot in my household that we cannot have a flat surface without it eventually becoming an altar. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you start doing things for beauty, and then it starts having more significance, and then maybe you throw in an ancestor's picture or a pretty rock that you found, and the next thing you know, you're building little pockets of sacred space all around you, and it makes the entire household sacred and uh, improves, at least in my opinion, uh, the serenity of the household when you do that, and I think that is something we do naturally as human beings we build these little altars, even if we don't recognize them. You go into a big family's household and you see a giant wall of photos of family going back generations. Um, or you go into someone's house and you see their beautifully tended um, rank upon rank of potted plants that they pour their time, energy, and effort into. And they are building sacred space in that relationship with that space. Uh, whether they're intending to or not, which I think is beautiful. Yes, uh, I love it. I love it. I love how you explain uh, everything. I, I'm trying to like not just say, read the book, because you're here right now, and we can take this wisdom from you at this moment. But also, I just want everyone to read this book. Uh, so something else that I really loved, aside from just these family stories and these anecdotes, that would, you would lead us into the magical practice um, from these stories is the, um, just the title, Burn a Black Candle. Will you, will you give us the, the story, the anecdote as to why we maybe got there and what burning a black candle might bring people? Yes, yes. Uh, so how do I put it? Burning a black candle is the go-to method in my family for, um, eliminating influences of the evil eye or any kind of disruptive influences that may be in your life, the very first thing that would happen is mom or grandma would slap a black candle in my hand and tell me to go home and burn it, for example. And I actually start the book off with reminiscing about seeing my mother and grandmother discussing something along those lines when I was much younger, and they wouldn't tell me what they were discussing or what they were doing. But later when I come back into the room, there's a little black candle burning in the corner. Um, and it has become the significant symbol of my family's spiritual practices uh, throughout my life. And so, you know, when it came to selecting a title for the book, of course, that was one of the first things that sprang to mind. I love that. I love that. Oh, God. I'm just going to keep saying that <laughs> over and over because I love it. Now, also earlier we were talking uh, about working with a lot of people think witchcraft is antithetical to any other organized religion. But in this book, we've got loads of saints <laughs> and how to work with them. And um, growing up, we, we, did go, we did go to church. It was, we just 
didn't do it. Um, but I still knew about it. St. Joseph, hearing St. Joseph to sell a house. Just by osmosis. I was like, oh, that's what you gotta do. I, I've never practiced it once in my life. But I love how it can marry. And will you, will you tell us a little bit about that too? How working with the saints and how many belief systems can come into uh, your craft. Sure. Um, when it comes to my mother and my grandmother in particular, and their generation in general um, of Italian American practitioners, um, they don't consider themselves anything other than, than good Catholics. Um, they are practicing a type of Catholicism, though, that a lot of other Catholics wouldn't realize or recognize in a lot of cases. Um, so, you know, we, you know, mom will tell me that. Christmas time to go and pick up some hay from the manger and keep it in my wallet to keep to keep money in my pocket all year round. And it took a while growing up to realize that's not what Catholics do <laughs> uh, normally. But you know there is this strong thread that my mother and grandmother they do not think did not think because my grandma is fast that they were doing magic. It was literally those things that we do, which has become a little bit of a cliche. In the, in the you know current generations of practitioners, and um, I think the current generation really wants to own it more and say yes, this is magic. Mm -hmm. um, but they do, I think, um, the practitioners that stay closely tied to their roots bring some of that Catholicism and folk Catholicism with them because it's inescapable. You cannot untangle it from the style of magic that my family practiced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, especially Appalachian uh, folk magic, you will have uh, people assigning psalms to things and putting a psalm under a candle. And um, I know when I first encountered that, I was like, I don't know about that. And you know, of course, <laughs> I read more working at a bookstore, right? I had to read it and it expanded um, my understanding and really opened a whole new world, which is something I really appreciate about Burn a Black Candle because it is a uh, book that is writing about a subject that honestly, and I'm very sorry, I had not considered. <laughs> I had not considered. I, I knew, you know, I think something that a lot of us might be guilty of, maybe I'm projecting, maybe it's just me, um, of not considering how we meld, right? And so you talk about the diaspora in your book as well, and you also uh, speak about how you know, different practices in different regions of Italy, and how when the a lot of Italians immigrated here, we had just this giant melding sort of forced together. And so there's these different practices that have married into each other. And I think that is, for whatever reason, it never crossed my mind, even though I know it's something to be true, right? Um, did you, uh, while writing this book, were you ever like, w what area is this from? Did you try and discern that? You didn't? Yeah. I did not. Um, I know the areas that my family is mm -hmm. from, um, because we're from around Naples and Benevento, um, but I don't know, I don't know how, what the, the chain of connections and interconnections were to bring the knowledge to me. And I was doing um, a discussion, one of the first discussions I ever did publicly on Italian American practical magic was on Clubhouse. And I was describing some of the things that my family does. And this woman said, kind of combatively with me, well, my family does that too. And we're not Italian American, so that's not Italian American. And I said, listen, <laughs> there's, there's so many different, like once you hit, even in, in Italy, there's so many different regions. There's so many different practices and variations. And then they hit the United States, and everybody mixes together. And they're not just mixing together with other Italian Americans, they're mixing together with African Americans, and they're mixing with you know Hispanics, and they're people from all over the United States. And they're sharing knowledge, and they're rubbing off on each other. And then some, you know, I was born in 1974. By the time 1974 rolls around, it's really hard to pick apart that ball of yarn and go, oh, this is the true Italian-American thread, and this other stuff we can discard. So my 
categorization method was if it came through mom and grandma and I learned it through them, then it's going in the book. <laughs> I'm really proud of you for not like reaching through the crowd and just going, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's frustrating. I think it was a good challenge though because yeah. I think um, for folks who don't take a wider view of occultism, magic, the esoteric community, these aren't concepts that they consider regularly. And so, you know, part of the joy of this book um, is having the opportunity to share ideas like this. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of times when you're sitting reading a book, you're very distant from the reality mm -hmm. that the book is representing. And um, I want people to know there's people behind these practices. There's whole, you know, there's a whole culture behind these practices, uh, but it's it's real life, so it's very messy and it's very interconnected. And I think the interconnection is absolutely beautiful, uh, but it makes it hard from an anthropological standpoint yeah. to go. That's the real Italian root and stuff. Yeah, that's like when people are like, "Well, Tara is from <laughs> this specific." <laughs> it's like, okay, cool, man. Uh, shut up. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a bit, you're super right. Um, so that makes what you, what you just said makes me think of when I was reading this book, I was like, I know that. Um, so, but there were a few like little, what, what I think the layman would call like superstitions that you talked about that I had not heard of, um, which is you never gift a sharp object. You, you, you don't gift a knife. You must give someone a penny or something to avoid, uh, for cutting. So I need quite a few pennies from quite a few people. Because <laughs> they give knives for whatever reason. That's what reasonable. they need to give, they need to give you a penny. Yeah. Um, I'll text them after this. I'll be like, look here. I need a penny. Here's my P.O. box. Um, but could you talk about some of these? Were those a, was there anything you were surprised about? Or is this all just something that you, like, just all from grandma and, and, and mom? This was all from grandma and mom that just had been uh, just in, ingrained in me year <laughs> after year. So, you know, things like if someone gives you a sharp object, you give it like scissors, knife, anything yeah. like that. You give them money, uh, just a token amount. So you're purchasing that from them. If uh, you give somebody a wallet, you never give them an empty wallet. You put some money in the wallet. Um, I always just thought it was my grandparents spoiling me. <laughs> you know, because they're grandparents, and they were just like, they were money trees, and they were just like, here's a dollar, here's 50 cents. But no, they were doing that so that that wallet would never be empty. Um, you know, they, my mother never let us put shoes on the bed, and I did not... You know, I just thought that was the cleanliness thing. Well, when I get older, I realize that no, that's a, you know, that's when you were dressing the corpse, you put shoes on the bed before you put them on the corpse's feet. So it's a very bad luck to put shoes on the bed. That's why you don't put a hat on the bed because when the priest would come to give the last rites, the priest wore a hat and would take a hat off and lay it at the foot of the bed. So a hat on the bed is an exceptionally bad idea. And Looking at it from an insider's perspective, and then taking the going outside of our culture to find the rationale and the interpretation for it, and then you know it, it just informs my childhood so much because when my grandfather passed, he had this beautiful straw hat that he would wear, and um, my grandmother would make her bed every day. Sorry, and she would put my grandpa's hat in the center of the bed as her final way to make the bed um, because she was perpetually in mourning for him. And so it didn't matter to her anymore if there was bad luck would happen on the bed. So, um, you know, reflecting on things like that when I was writing the book, I did a lot of crying <laughs> I will confess. Um, but, you know, most of it was happy tears. But, you know, teasing out those significances, I think, is an important part of later generations because I think that rationale is important and that doesn't often come a lot of the times with folk practices. It's just here's what you do in this instance mm -hmm. and then you move on. There's not a lot of explanation for why. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. It's, it's very, um, it's very sweet. 
Thank you very much for sharing that. Now, um, the next question is kind of lazy because I'm going to ask you, what do people forget to ask you that you want to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a hard one. Let me yeah, think. thank you. It's all on you now. I've, <laughs> I've asked my questions. It's not great that I did it, but here we are. <laughs> I think this is what I, one of the things I like to talk about a lot, and, um, and that is if you delve into your family's or your community's magical practices, uh, there's ways that you can ask questions that will get you better answers than just going, hey, mom, do we do any magic? Because <laughs> nobody thinks they do magic. Nobody, um, you know, from traditional cultures call themselves a witch. Witchcraft is what other people do. You know, questionably, people do magic and witchcraft. This other stuff is just the stuff we do all the time, and there's nothing special about it. So when you explore your families or your community's practices, there's two things that you can do. One is you can uh, phrase your questions like, well, what would Grandma do if she didn't think she was going to be able to make rent that month? Or uh, what did Grandpa do if he was afraid a bad storm was coming? The, the what's and the how's uh, can be really productive and give you a lot of good information. Um, and it's a sneaky way where suddenly they say, you know, oh, Grandpa, he'd always, that's weird, he'd always put a, a, a knife in the window when a storm was coming. And then it's like, oh, okay, wait a minute. Why did Grandpa put a knife in the window? And a lot of times, the generation you're talking to doesn't know why. That's when you start doing the book work, and that's when you start to, you know, do that do that research. Um, and then the other piece of advice for folks who are delving into uh, asking questions about magical practices in your communities: be prepared to share your own practices first to make people more comfortable with revealing this information to you because uh, most folks aren't ready to just hand over their family's weird little practices to someone. Uh, so you have to share, like, um, I, I had a, a coworker uh, who was from India and she was walking through the office with a basil plant one day. And I'm like, well, that's a cool basil plant. And she looked very embarrassed. Uh -huh. And I was like, you know, my mom and dad plant a basil plant at their front door to keep negative junk away. And she looked at me and she's like, well, that's what we do with our basil plants. And then she sat down and told me all about how her family plants this basil plant and what kind of basil it was. It was different than my basil, of course. And, and we learned a lot from each other. But you got to sometimes be willing to go out on the limb and reveal your own practices and ideas first to let people know they're in a safe space talking to a safe person who really has a genuine interest. So those are my two pieces of advice for learning from people in your community or people in your family. I'm glad I asked that question <laughs> and you did all the work. Thank you so much. And you talk about that in your book too. And when I read that, I was like, oh, I love being sneaky. That's fantastic. Got to be sneaky. Yeah, <laughs> right? Sometimes, yeah. Um, so I uh, want to open up for any questions from the audience, if you're comfortable with that. Okay. Um, you don't have to be sneaking now, though, because we're here in the seven. <laughs> so please, any questions for Dee, y'all? Um, so I ha obviously haven't read the book. Um, I do apologize, but I have one now. A lot of the things you talked about were things that I didn't realize growing up Hispanic are also things. So the knife thing, I was like, my mom used to do that. <laughs> like she had a list of her wedding of anybody that gave her any type of cutlery wow. and sent them all money. And it was literally like a peso coin, but enough to do that. So, um, do you think a lot of that comes from the Catholicism side and the mysticism that's very much so in Catholicism that Catholics don't like to admit? Or do you think it comes more from the regional Italian side that we see a lot of that? Obviously there's no right or right, but. Yeah. I think, and, and this is terrible, I talk about being lazy, I think the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, you know, as, as we were driving down here, I was talking to my partner and we were talking about, you know, not only do things mix and mingle, but also things crop up in independently um, from each other sometimes, either through cultural practices or through, you know, just 
innovation or you know some magical concept. Uh, so I think there are a lot of similarities between the different magical folk practices, and I think sometimes Catholicism is the thread that ties them all together. Um, but I think that the practices that we share from our different cultures um, could come from either. You know, I couldn't really think of though a Catholic concept or idea that would would generate that practice. So not my Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> Your Catholic's different. <laughs> um, so I would say it could be either place, but I would guess that it comes more from the specific cultures than the the overarching Catholicism. JB, hit us. Yes, I'm sorry if you already answered this because I was busy with something back there for a second. But I was wondering what kind of what kind of things did you do to help you with like excavating those childhood memories besides interviewing? Because I know memory is so weird when you're writing about life. So were there any things that helped you like bring the memories back and maybe even surprise you? Um, when it came? I have a light bulb memory of uh, sitting on the couch with a notebook in my lap and with my partner Brent sitting next to me and I'm literally brainstorming stuff mom and grandma taught me and I fill up about two pages and that's it. And I, I look over at him and I say, I think I want to write this book but I just don't think I have enough content. And he kind of laughs, he's laughing right now and he said, just start writing and see what happens. And that was some of the best advice about this book that I ever received because I took that list and started expanding on each one of the topics that I noted down. And as I did, more and more memories and, and, and ideas and thoughts came to me, um, more experiences I had individually with some of the practices came to, back to me. and. Um, when we talk about that influence from the ancestors, they had a big part in it too because throughout my life when I finally got my mom and grandmother comfortable enough to sit down and let me take notes while I spoke to them, I would take the notes dutifully and I am a note taker like crazy. I have lots and lots of notes on everything and I couldn't even find some of them when I started writing the book and I really wanted to get my hands on them. and. Um, but especially because my grandmother had already passed. And so I often literally found the notes falling out onto the floor and landing at my feet when I was looking for something else. Like literally hitting my feet uh, as I pull something out of my filing cabinet and here's the notes I had been looking for for months. And it, it happened two separate times. So I think um, when it comes to memory, a lot of it is just expecting it to be there. You don't have a, a full path. You have one step and you just make the next step and the next step and, and your memory brings you back the information that you need. Uh, but I also think I had a little bit of help from the ancestors on, and my family um, reminding me where all those notes and, and scribblings I had taken throughout my life were. Liz. Okay. Well, I mean, this is like, you know, it's definitely like a very positive book and it's positive energy. But, so I have to ask this question though, it's like, what, what do you say to people, um, it probably comes from fear of something that's strange, that, that are afraid of this or think that it's, um, you know, satanic or <laughs> whatever. I mean, I'm sure you must get some People are just like, oh, magic, that's the devil's work, and, you know, just shut that down. Well, way back in about uh, 1999 or so, I worked uh, at a company that will remain nameless. <laughs> uh, but there was a, a woman, uh, a couple cubicles over for me, and she was going on and on about witches, and I don't know why, but in the workplace and ranting about how untrustworthy and evil they were. <laughs> And I am not a confrontational person, uh, but I stood up and I smoked at the time and I said, everybody, I'm going out to smoke a cigarette and I'm also a witch. So if anyone wants to know about witchcraft, please step outside and ask me whatever questions that you want. And that has 
turned into kind of my philosophy and approach my entire life is I'm <laughs> sneaky in that I let people get to know me first. And this well, turned out that the woman who was doing the ranting, we were buddies. And, you know, she had a very high opinion of me. And that helped change her opinion of witchcraft and magic. Uh, because suddenly she realized she knew someone that was one. And, and she had to, to work with that a little bit. Um, but I can honestly say that so far, um, knock wood and, and, and touch iron, nobody has uh, expressed any negativity towards me or the book yet. Um, I'm still waiting on Tinter folks for that to happen. And what I think it does when people do, as they will, it opens up an opportunity for dialogue. And so you just have to be open to that dialogue and trust in human nature that that kind of conversation can take place. And it won't work for everybody. Some people will, you know, storm away or, you know, cast aspersions, aspersions on me and my family. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so far so good. I haven't had a lot of negative reactions from folks. And, and I work in a very corporate environment and I just, because it was going to be right out there, I just told my boss and I told the people that I work with, and they're all very supportive. They just think it's the neatest thing. <laughs> so, um, so far I'm very lucky, I think. <laughs> yeah, that can be a hard conversation without it being like polarizing. You're like, I don't know, just trust me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was an excellent answer. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Hey, I'm Claire Sorgenti, Italian American witch. Hi. Um, it just felt so meant to be to be here today. We're from Clarkstone. We just opened up a metaphysical shop and we were handing out flyers. We saw your sign in the window. One of our customers works here. It just, it's everything feels very connected. Um, so I want to say thank you for doing this, for what, for welcoming us here, and just speaking what you have to say. It was just so beautiful. Um, I wanted to ask about your, your deck. I've just, I'm just about to finish my own tarot deck, and do you have any advice on working with publishers or self-publishing? <laughs> <laughs> Anything like that at all? I like, uh, start laughing nervously. So my deck is independently published, cool. and at the time it was because I was terrified to try to do anything else. Uh, if I knew what I was going to have to learn in order to get it printed and get the art formatted correctly, et cetera, et cetera, I might have been braver and submitted to more publishers. Mm. Uh, however, it is very nice uh, to be able to have complete and utter control over something as personal and uh, meaningful as a deck. Uh, so there are several places online. There's Make Playing Cards. They're excellent. And um, Game Crafters is another excellent company uh, that work with independent creators of card decks. And they're the ones that, you know, when I found it was uh, Game Crafters is the one I went with. And they were amazing. Uh, and their support was amazing. And it, it was very helpful. So I would just say if you're going to go the independent route, uh, shop around with the different printers and see what your options are and figure out what's good for your deck um, and what and pay attention to the kind of support that they're willing to give people who are just starting out. Cool. Thank you so much. That's so cool. <laughs> what's the name of your new store? Shop of Wonders in Clarksdale. Shop, Shop of oh, Wonders in Clarksdale. I'm writing that down because I won't forget. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Shop of Wonders. Do we have any more questions? Are we all set for the evening? If so, um, let's get you to sewing some stock. Okay. Thank you so much, Dee. <laughs> uh, if anybody's watching online, you can buy her book at squarebooks.com. Just type in Burn a Black Candle. And if you live in town, you can buy it here until 7 p.m. when we close. And then 10 a.m. we open the next day. Come get a book. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. You. Oh,